exciting for you? Oh, it was very exciting, especially for me and my family. Um, I feel like I prayed on the moment to happen like this, and I'm, I'm just so thankful um, that this organization gave me a chance. So. And then today, you know, fellow 905 Kobe is getting the 10-day contract. He spoke about how you're just a guy. What was it like to see him get his chance, you know, and share this moment with him, too? Um, it was, um, I was excited for him uh, when I found out the news yesterday. So um, for him to just come in and just continue to build and play his game, um, I was just happy to see it. How have you been able to kind of uh, take some positives from this tough stretch for the team? Um, we could just keep building, honestly. Um, I feel like the, uh, us younger guys out there could just keep building and working um, with each other each and every day. And by the time either uh, in the next year or beginning of the next year, uh, we'll be fine. What kind of message have you got from the coaching staff in terms of growing your game as a facilitating point guard? Like, you know, clearly you can get kind of get trophy, you can score at all the levels, but, you know, those solo, kind of the nuances of playing point guard, which, what are they trying to get you to work on and improve? Um, just relax out there. Um, I know it's a fast-paced game out there, but um, just take my time and um, be able to get what I want. So. Um, became aware of that uh, today, pretty much like anybody else, and um, uh, caught me off the guard. But uh, at this point, I really don't have any comment on that. The, the two games that he um, pulled himself out of, one was an eye injury and the other was illness, did anything seem unusual to you in either of those instances? Uh, just... No, because uh, from my perspective as a coach of the team, I never uh, doubt uh, injuries. I never doubt you know, honesty from players. Obviously, I never had a situation like, like this before. And uh, you know, so I did not. Did you have a conversation with the team after you found out that there was an investigation, or, or what did that look like? Uh, I one? did not. Uh, it really happened uh, right before the game, um, and the news broke out. And uh, we were focused on on basketball. We were focused on a game tonight, and I was trying to get our guys ready for the game tonight. Is this kind of distraction difficult? Like, did people, did your players seem upset? I did not talk, talk to players, so I do not know their reaction. Um, I just don't know. I, I just know that nobody wants those kind of uh, situations to happen to anybody, to any team, and um, we just got to deal with it. Have you, Jamie Bickerstaff, made some comments a little while ago about how he's had you know threats to himself because of people calling him. I think Tyrese Halbert made comments. Have you had any interaction with people kind of of that ilk? People, has there been any impact of gambling on you in that respect? Uh, no, I never gambled in my life. Um, I have 18 or 19 uh, NBA summer leagues uh, with the different teams. I never gambled one dollar in uh, in uh, Las Vegas, so that's definitely out of my zone of interest or or knowledge. But and I did not have any any contacts from anybody. So nobody has caught like threatened you or anything or come to you and say, uh, why didn't my player play more minutes because I need the problem? Never had those uh, those situations. I'm not using social media, so I'm not checking any of that. If somebody tried to reach out or anything, but no, I did not have that experience yet. Uh, RJ and Emmanuel were both on the bench tonight. Uh, when do you expect them back? Uh, they're just uh, now in the process of reconditioning, and we're going to take it uh, day by day um, and see you know, as a group, we're going to evaluate when they're going to be physically, mentally ready to, to join the team and play. On the uh, lighter side of things, you guys set the franchise record for assists in a season. I know it's like 11 losses in a row, but speaking to the overall of the offensive system, how do you feel that kind of endorses what you've been trying to teach and trying to coach all season? Um, I think overall for, for a season as a team, uh, we're doing a pretty good job of, of moving the ball. Uh, you know, having uh, a lot of players, a lot of different lineups out there. I think it speaks uh, a volume of uh, commitment of our guys to try to play to, to that style. And I think it's just like we talked about the other day, planting the seeds and good seeds uh, for, for the future of, of our team. 
Um, you know what, uh, joining a team uh, after, you know, 71 game and, you know, new teammates and everything. Overall, I thought that, that he did uh, well. Um, during the course of the game, I was trying to coach him on a spot to recognize some of the situations offensively and defensively. I liked his initiative to pick up uh, full court and, you know, to, to play some aggressive defense. And I thought in the half court that he had a couple of really good drives. Uh, some of those finished with layups or assists. Some of those he had the potential to, to make a little bit better decisions. But all of that to be expected at this point. So this is a very disappointing development for Toronto. Um, <clears throat> to those of you who following my takes on this, Jonte Porter is easily one of the best revelations of the season. He has been one of the five or six best players on this team. And I know some people find that very hard to believe, but he has been that good defensively, offensively. He's been really solid. And in a weird way, he was replacing a guy that I already really liked a lot, which is Christian Coloco. And now in a single season, you receive news that not only will one guy not possibly play basketball again in Christian Coloco until he gets better, um, you also receive word that, you know, for a guy like Jonte, who is not a major, you know, recruit or it's not like John Morant or Zion Williamson did this, in which case, you know, maybe this is like, this is serious, serious stuff, right? And it, in a weird way, it shouldn't be, right? Because he is a fringe role player, um, you know, betting on the under. But yeah, there was a particular evening or night um where his parlay bet or his player props led FanDuel and that was very strange now I will say this he is probably the best 11th or 12th guy in the league so if someone just figured out that he's really freaking good if when he plays that's not a mystery to me um I've never seen his player props ever but if I had yeah, I would take the one steal and one block and I would sleep easy knowing that if he plays, he's probably going to get one steal and one block. Do you know what I mean? Um, this opens up a much larger conversation about sports betting in general. There have been a lot of allegations of referees, stars, etc. cetera. Um, I think we can talk about in general a couple things. Uh, this was a very, very big day for hoops. Huge day for hoops. And if you were watching it early, it seemed like nothing surprising was going to happen today. It seemed like Iowa was going to win. The Iowa uh, women's team, of course, with Caitlin Clark, was going to win. Um, it seemed like every team in the NBA that was supposed to be blowing out the team that they were facing was going to win, right? And then we see this massive comeback from the Atlanta Hawks against the Boston Celtics. And I was just like, uh-oh, are, are the Raptors going to beat the Nets? <laughs> And it's true. Um, you know, Garrett Temple was on the Will Lou show talking yesterday or the day before sometime about, you know, the perils of tanking and, you know, how it's sort of a little bit destructive, you know, to think that way and how players need to go out and try to win anyway. And here I am, you know, wanting a team that I absolutely am rooting for because of the way the system is designed. I'm rooting for them to lose every single game from here on out. And I'll be very, very upset if they win another game this season. And that's just the math of it, because, of course, you know, there's win the day and there's all sorts of stuff. But one thing that Garrett Temple did say is that this is the few one of the few teams that he's ever been on that has initiated a tank where the vibes have been this good. Um, Paradise Lost saying what happened to Jonte? So a report broke out earlier um, that Jonte Porter is being investigated for uh, sports betting, effectively that the investigation is involving whether or not he was involved with suspicious bets on his player props. And I want to be very careful with how I say this because we do kind of exist in a society where people are held guilty for things before they're proven to be guilty. Um, such instances, of course, of Jalen Harris, you know, for instance, you know, people just going out and saying, you know, he's a drug addict or some shit like that. No, you want to be careful when you don't have enough information. And I don't have any information on this. But I will tell you this, I've gotten to know a lot about Jonte Porter over the last six months, I was actually doing one of those, I was going to do a profile video on him because 
he was just so freaking interesting, like his backstory. And this is just completely, this is not an accusation. Anyone who's followed this channel knows that I like the guy a lot. Like I like him. He's one of my favorite players on the team. Let me put it this way. If you told me that a Raptor had done this and you asked me to put money on which Raptor had done this, I would pick him. Um, he is insanely smart. That usually helps for something like this to orchestrate something like this. Um, he's a bit of a hustler, you know, in, in a sense, like some of his childhood stories remind me of, you know, things that I did when I was a kid. He's obsessed with chess. I don't know. These are all things that make me think weirdly enough that he is at least somebody who could entertain the idea of um, trying to exploit a weakness in the system, if you will. Um, maybe looking at himself as being so insignificant and so inconsequential that maybe him sitting out a second half in which, you know, a vast majority of betters had taken the under on his player props would not raise too many red flags. However, I will say that whenever, whenever there is a bet that massively loses for the casinos or for the bet, uh, you know, for the betting books, there's always, always going to be a little bit of scrutiny and a little bit of attention to it. And yeah, if that's, you know, Luka Doncic 40 point triple double, and then, you know, everyone bets that Luka is going to have a 40 point triple double and he ends up having a 40 point triple double, that's going to raise a lot of eyebrows. But dude, if it's Jonte Porter under, you know, four rebounds or three rebounds or whatever the hell it was, yeah, that's going to be a very, very weird. It's going to be a weird thing for sports books to lose money on. So I'm inclined to say that if they have launched such a public investigation, they have more grounds than just mere coincidence. And I'm just preparing myself for the Raptors have released Jonte Porter and blah, blah, blah. And so you move on, unfortunately. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. But I don't think I am. Um, which is a bummer. Because he fits in so beautifully with how the Raptors play. Um, it's a bummer. It really is. Anyways, um, moving on to the game. Uh, Dennis Schroeder pays the Raptors back by leading the Brooklyn Nets over the Toronto Raptors. I never thought I would ever say anything nice about Jen Dennis Porter. Uh, Dennis, wow. Dennis Schroeder. But here I go. Thank you, Dennis Schroeder, for continuing on with the tank. See, Dennis Schroeder is the original tank commander. He is the original guy who started the tank. He started it in Miami. And really, he's the reason we even have our pick right now, because had he not been such a train wreck earlier in the season, quite frankly, you know, disruptive chemistry, et cetera, setting up guys over leverage as a playmaker, you see him now with a way less talented roster around him. Like, I mean, Mikel Bridges is Mikel Bridges, but he's no Scotty Barnes and he's no Pascal Siakam. So let's be real. This guy is playing like really off the ball and really sober. And I'm like, why couldn't he have just done this for us in the beginning? We would have had a pretty successful season. It's weird. Um, we have a super chat here. I feel like since this is a weak draft, giving up the pick won't be so bad. Remember when we had the first pick in another weak draft? Um, weird logic because you had the second pick in that draft be a really good player in LaMarcus Aldridge, and he was a multiple-time All-Star. And you had the sixth pick in that draft, if I'm not mistaken, which was Brandon Roy, who was on his way to becoming one of the top five players in the league, had you know injuries not derailed him. There's always going to be talent. Um, I honestly think Andrea's career could have been very different too. So, yeah, like, I mean, it's... I'm not saying there's superstars in this draft that you need to tank for, like Wembenyama or Zion or whatever. Um, but so often we've heard of a weak draft and it's turned out to be so great. You know, the Paolo, Chet, Jabari draft was supposed to be a pretty weak draft, right? Relatively speaking, the Anthony Edwards draft, Anthony Edwards, LaMelo Ball, James Wiseman was supposed to be a weak draft. Now, James Wiseman certainly is weak, but... <clears throat> LaMelo has been better than Cade and Cade was supposed to be generational. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you can only judge so far. Now I understand that, that a lot of that evaluation was a little bit screwed up because of COVID and I get that. So 
maybe this is a more fair evaluation. But I do believe, honestly, that you know the Raptors will be very, very much better off taking their chances and getting their pick this year. And I do want to say also that the math on this is pretty obvious, that even with the six worst odds, there's still a substantial and a good chance that you still lose the pick. So, you know, again, all you need is one team behind you to move up and you're out, you're toast. And you're not catching any of the teams ahead of you at all, right? Tonight, the Memphis Grizzlies lose. The Toronto Raptors also lose. Um, We will see. I don't know if they will hold out Emmanuel quickly and RJ Baird for the rest of the season. That would be quite an obvious tank move. You've lost 11 straight games. Um, tonight comes with a little bit of a you know catch-22, if you will, right? So let me share the screen here. Not a catch-22. It's a, it's a, let's call it a bittersweet. So the bitter is that you have 88 points on the board, which is a season low in terms of points scored for the Toronto Raptors. The sweet is that this game comes in the midst of the Raptors setting the single uh, season mark for most assists in a, in, a, in a season for the Toronto Raptors historically. And they've had some really interesting, you know, pass first friendly, you know, European style offenses before they had 2006, where they had Garbo Hossa and uh, TJ Ford and Jose Calderon. Granted, pace was not nearly as great back then in 2006, but passing was a huge part of how that team was good. Um, you also had the We the North, you know, team with Kyle Lowry and, you know, and then you had the championship iteration Raptors. We had Marc Gasol and movement and and passing were huge, huge parts of those teams as well. So the fact that you have done this and with time to spare, by the way, like there's, there's more than 10 games to go in the season right now, or there's exactly 10 games to go in the season. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is quite quite a feat to accomplish, um, even when you take stat inflation into account. It's quite crazy. Uh, let's, let's take a look at the team stats tonight. The Raptors do manage to pull this one out in terms of losing. Uh, they do so despite taking more shots. And they just shot abysmally from three. Both teams shot abysmally from three. When's the last time you saw an NBA game where one team shot 18 percent, the other shot 23? Like, this was ugly to watch. It really was. It was like watching. The battle of the tank. And really the only way the Nets even won this game was they doubled the Raptors on the offensive glass. They got on the glass uh, for 16 boards. And they they just murked them on rebounds, 50 to 30. Um, but in terms of assists, the Raptors win that battle. Steals, you know, it's the stocks battle. Uh, the Nets turned the ball over twice as much. But yeah, it was just that simple right? The Raptors don't give up 60 points in the paint. Congratulations. They give up 52. Um, and yeah, the Nets had a 13 point lead at one point, but it got, it got too close, too close for comfort for me. Um, in terms of who Sean bright for the Nets, well, it wasn't really Mikhail Bridges. I thought he struggled. He did twist an ankle at some point, but that was a little bit later in the game. I wondered if that played a part in terms of how he closed, but honestly, he's been really bad for at least two months now ever since the nets tanked that game against milwaukee it seems like he has not really recovered and his pre tank game stats and his post tank game stats are ridiculous um jalen wilson you know he was fairly positive tonight he has you know he leads a pretty balanced attack 13 points for bridges uh 12 points for wilson and 11 points for dorian finney smith um Nick Claxton was largely invisible offensively. I think like some of his passing and limited passing really show up. Obviously, Nick has been widely rumored as a Raptors target in the offseason. I don't know about that. Like watching him was was quite sad, really, to see some of the playmaking and stuff. And I'm just like, damn, like I'm not really seeing it, you know, like I get the shot blocking and, you know, some of some of the paint protection stuff. But like, really, like if he doesn't put on weight and he's not he's didn't become a better playmaker and he's not really much of a shooter, like I'm not really seeing some team out there trying to park 25 to 30 million dollars in this guy. If you could get him for 15, holy shit, that would be really worth it. If you can get him for 18, that might still be worth it. But anytime you go north of 20 for a guy like Nick Claxton, I think you're starting to get in trouble. Um, 
Watford was probably the best player on their team. Um, he, he and Schroeder lead the way with 19 points apiece. I don't know where the hell they would have been. I liked what I saw from Noah Clowney, and I love what I saw from Daron Sharp. Like, I have been a big proponent for, like, I want Daron Sharp on the Raptors. You know, like, big lob target, no Scotty. They played together in high school. It would be great, but stay lovey. Um, in terms of the Raptors, honestly, there's this entire game should go to three guys. Number one, it should go to Schroeder as an ex Raptor for leading the charge for the Nets, but it should also go to Kelly Olenek and probably let's say Bruce Brown, you know, like whenever the Raptors got it going and like really the guys who got it going in terms of like energy and force were guys like Javon Freeman, Liberty, Grady Dick. Kobe Simmons, who was freaking awesome. Like, Kobe was really good. Um, Even Jordan Noara in bursts. I think Garrett Temple had good moments. Like, you had these, like, moments where the Raptors looked so much better. Do you know what I mean? Like, their offensive process was so good that it was just like... And they felt so energetic. And then at one point, they were even playing defense. And you're like, how are they going to lose this game? Are the Nets so bad? Like, how are they going to lose this game? Um, Paradise Lost saying, why Jack is, why Yak is still off? Um, I'm pretty sure he's done for the season, actually. So, yeah. Um, he had surgery, did he not? So, yeah. Anyway, it was really not a great game. Uh, I thought Ochai was was good. Like I think I think he was solid. Like there's really not a lot to talk about with this game, right? Like you're literally like I'm sitting there rooting for this team to lose. I'm not sure how they're gonna lose. And then that Bruce Brown turnover, that like transition opportunity lost because he double dribbled the basketball, and you just felt the air and the momentum shift out of the building and out of the team he looked over his teammate like yeah i know what we're doing do you know what we're doing and you know everyone can talk about like this entire oh my god like the raptors you know no one would ever go out and try to lose games on purpose and blah 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 blah. okay how many games can i think of where the raptors had the game and the other team did absolutely nothing to win the game but then somehow the raptors just had like a comedy of errors like, do you think this is just the most unclutched team in the world? Or maybe there are like a couple of veterans who kind of get the bigger picture of what the Raptors are doing and they'll just occasionally throw the ball away and fail to get back on defense. I don't know. Because I'm telling you, this game was impossible to lose. With the with how bad the Nets were playing, like it felt impossible to lose. Um James said, I think. Porter took the under tonight. <sighs> Here's the thing. Um, I understand that I'm asking people who are probably not millionaires to have empathy for, you know, a professional athlete uh, who makes over a million dollars. I get that. Um, but he is still under 25, number one. So he's like, to me, yeah, sure, he's a young adult or whatever, and you know, he has guidance and he should have known better if he's guilty and blah, 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 blah. But what I really don't appreciate, and, and I've seen a lot of it, is people calling him stupid or people calling him an idiot or people, you know, trying to almost like mock it or like even having fun at his expense. Like, see, a buddy taught you, first of all, taking pleasure in someone else's misery and this is i'm sure a very miserable moment for him uh regardless of what you think they did to deserve it it's never cool um number two if he's stupid (laughs) oh my god i i consider myself pretty good at judging how smart people are and he might be one of the smartest raptors of all time um so yeah like he's really really intelligent like i can tell from how he talks and and how he's thought things through and stuff so yeah he's made a really big mistake but you know they they say that um intelligence is often a a precursor to deviance as well um so basically when you look at um criminal populations right anyone who does anything wrong in terms of against the law you will see outliers on both sides. It's either people who are extremely stupid, 
or people who are extremely smart, right? Typically, it is your, you know, 106 IQ, middle of the road type of person who's not going to break the law. But if you have like a 166 IQ, or if you have a 65 IQ, mostly those are the two categories of people that are most likely to break the law and break the law in very different re- in very different ways, right? So again, they call it deviance for a reason because it's deviation from the mean, right? So I think John T. Porter is a very atypical person and a very atypical athlete. Like he's very unique in a lot of ways in terms of how he plays, in terms of how he thinks, in terms of what he's interested in, all that stuff. So yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, but I can tell you, like, I, I, I really don't understand people calling him stupid because if he's stupid, what are you, right? Like, I, I really, I don't understand that at all. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, I mean, I want to talk briefly about this Caitlin Clark stuff, right? Because this is dominating everything, right? Um, and I'm a little bit torn about it, to be honest. And, and there, there's a lot of stuff happening that's that's a uh, um, has a lot to do with um, how we have been going politically for a while now. So let me just pull this off the screen and just make myself a little big here. So Cheryl Swoops um, said some stuff about Caitlin Clark, uh, which which is categorically false, right? She said that. I think she said something like she takes 40 shots a game or something on the Gilbert Arenas podcast, which in fact is not true. She takes 19 or so a game. She said that she's 25 years old and basically playing against a bunch of kids, which is not true. She's 22 years old. She said something along the lines of she's had longer time to break the records than Kelsey Plum and herself, which is also not true. She's a senior. She just, you know, I would just won tonight. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the growth of the women's game and if the faces of the future need to look like the faces of the past right specifically is Caitlin Clark too white too religious and too straight to effectively be the face of the WNBA a league which according to some people is 98% LGBTQ. Shut the hell up about that. It's not true. It's less than 50%. But it is it the way the league presents itself, it is very progressive, extremely liberal. And if you look at what liberal values have been presented as, a straight white woman who believes in God and has a boyfriend and is from, you know, where she's from is probably not going to be the model face of your league. You're going to want someone like Brittany Griner, right? Or even Diana Taurasi. And I think it's so weird to listen to people talk about this because everyone is using, everyone uses, this is something I've realized. Everyone uses things that happen in the news to prop up what, things that they already believe to be true, right? I'll give you an example. Let's say you're like some racist right-wing nut who believes that black people disproportionately commit crimes. You're going to look at this Jonte Porter thing and you're going to be like, see, told you. Do you know what I mean? And and you're going to have like, and, and the worst part about the internet is no matter what you say, there's always someone out there who agrees with you. And there's always someone out there who's more extreme than you. And you got to start to see through it, man. So on the Caitlin Clark being too white or Paige Beckers being too white or, you know, WNBA athletes being threatened by these young women and et cetera. I'm like, yo, you don't have to go to the WNBA and you don't have to go to, you know, black, white, anything. You can see that resentment between black people and white people. You can see that resentment between Scotty and Fred, 100%. 100%, you can see that between Scotty and Fred. You can see that resentment between, you know, Darius Miles and LeBron James. I mean, there's no there's no gay person there. There's no there's no white person there. I mean, obviously, if you have people who believe that they are disproportionately underpaid and you have somebody 
who is making more money in NIL deals in college than they are making as professional basketball players, there's going to be some element of resentment there. There's going to be some element of jealousy. But to the question of whether Caitlin Clark is too white to be the face of women's basketball, two things. Number one, two schools of thought on this. First school of thought is sports is the only place where racism is less prevalent, whereby talent wins out 90% of the time. Personally, I still see the seeds of systemic racism in terms of how we cover sports and how we talk about sports and how sports athletes move up in the world because there are still historical disadvantages that I believe certain groups and certain you know um, communities face. And I think that that's just, for me, that is unquestionably true. But for some people, it's like, hey, this is more fair than you know ownership. When you look at look at the fan base of the NBA, what percentage of fans are like white? A lot, like a lot of fans are white. What percentage of the U.S. population is white? A lot. It's like more than sixty percent of the U.S. population is white. Okay, so the NBA players are over seventy percent black. So this to some people is like, this is the system working or this is, this is, uh, you know, athletes beating the system or whatever. This is true across most major sports. I think whatever your political alignment here, I think it is worth noting two things. Number one, no, she is not too white to be the face of college basketball or women's hoops because neither was Diana Taurasi, you know, and, and nor was Lisa Leslie too, too black, nor was Maya Moore too black. I think it's okay to note that she should not be judged entirely by the color of her skin. I also think the nuanced argument here is that you should not completely ignore the color of her skin either because I think the question then becomes, if a woman of color was doing what she was doing, would it be as impressive? Would it be as talked about? And if your answer to that is yes, then we have no issue. But if your answer to that is no, then that is the issue, isn't it? That to be more marketable because of the color of your skin, I think draws some issues for a lot of people. Now, if I were advising the WNBA, and I'm not trying to mansplain or anything like that, but if I were, if I were a conciliary or whatever, like if I was just like a person who was asked to come and speak to WNBA players and be like, what should we do about this? I would say grin and bear it. <sighs> Honestly, I, I, I would say grin and bear it because, you know, this is not a business that has been super profitable for a very long time. Um, you know, we're talking over 25 years, the WNBA has existed and it has been, you know, not a huge draw for a lot of people. I'm seeing, you know, games with 3,000, 4,000 people that are about to become games with 15,000 people. I mean, this girl is, she's box office. Um, so I think, you know, if and, and again, it's not just the white factor. It's also the Steph Curry factor of relatability. So many WNBA players in the past, whether it be Lisa Leslie or Candace Parker, are so unrelatably large. They're just large. It, it's the Shaq argument or the Yao Ming argument. You know, those guys are never going to lead sneaker sales, right? Somehow, Caitlin Clark being identifiable makes it better. Does the fact that she's white lean into her identifiableness, given that the country in which she plays in is majority white? Well, I don't know. Sure. Of course it does. It's, you'd be stupid to think it does not play into it. Um, I do think race plays a part into sports. I don't think it always has to be a bad thing. You know, um, I used to think it was a terrible thing. I, I used to get really upset when, you know, um, People would, uh, I think there was a, <sighs> there was a game in like 1980 something in which uh, both benches cleared their, cleared their sides and like all five scrubs on both teams were white. And so you had five white players against five white players. And Tommy Heinsohn, you know, uh, Celtics broadcaster said, 
if you have your VCR, basically record this because this might be the last time you ever see 10 white players on an, on an NBA court. There's a lot of players or people out there who are so weirdly backwards and old school that they actually thirst for a time when that was the case. And to those people, I don't think they represent the majority of Caitlin Clark fans. I think the majority of Caitlin Clark fans are just people who enjoy her spirit and her competitive spirit. And personally, I'm kind of sick of allowing, you know, two to 3% of a demographic to speak for the other 97%. Do you know what I mean? Like, is race playing a part into in terms of her marketability in certain segments? Yes. Does race play a part in how I view her? Hell no. I don't care. My favorite part, my favorite player for for years was Candace Parker. You know, um, I like Kelsey Plum. You know, like I, I mean, these are these are players that I'm, I like. Diana Taurasi. Now I just named two white players instead of you know I just named three white players out of four. Okay. You know, I don't personally love watching Asia Wilson play basketball. I'm sorry. Like, I don't. I understand she's really great, but the skill element of it, you know, like shit, that matters to me. And that's, 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 that's been how I've viewed male basketball players as well. I was a way bigger Allen Iverson fan than I was a Dale Davis fan or a Dikembe Mutombo fan or an Alonzo Mourning fan. And frankly, if you're being honest, so were you. So was everybody. You know, so I think Caitlin Clark is good for women's hoops. I hope that the WNBA will not go all political stick on her and will just allow it to happen because it's good for the game. Um, I've always believed that people who have this mentality of like, you know, we got to eat because I fed us uh, are always the people who fail in life. Um, at some point, you do have to just believe that if it's benefiting the group, it, then everybody's eating, right? Um, like if you're part of a team and your goal is to suppress good ideas because they're not your ideas, then you're not really part of that team. You know, um, the collaborative mindset here is that WMA players are together in a group and they have a vested interest alongside the other players and the star players and the owners and the NBA and the men's you know, side, all of them together have a best interest in growing this thing and making it good because it exists at a time when hoops are basically summer stuff like Olympics. And so having like, for instance, you know, if Toronto gets a WNBA team, doesn't it make a difference that Paige Beckers and Caitlin Clark are coming this weekend? Do you know what I mean? Doesn't it make a difference that Candace Parker is playing her final game in Toronto? Doesn't this make a difference that Asia, uh, Asia and the Mercury are, are or, or the Vegas Aces are coming to Toronto, like the defending champions are coming to Toronto? Like it's a good place for the game to be. And I think it's um, it's sort of sad that resentment and jealousy is going to play a part in terms of how Paige um and and Caitlin are covered because they're obviously both very young, charismatic women with a hell of a lot of game and a lot of spunk. They just happen to have, the, you know, white skin, and they're entering a league. And I believe they're both straight. I don't remember if uh, Paige Beckers is straight, but I know Caitlin Clark is straight. So, um, I will say though that it seems like a lot of the weird talks about white players seem to be coming from white reporters. To that, I will say liberal media is weirdly pandering not covering and you know there's this old saying go woke uh, go woke go broke and i think it polarizes people a lot it's not to say that you shouldn't have progressive values or that you, sh you should believe the same things your grandfather believed about race and religion and you know gender and identity and whatever you should be progressive i believe you know it would be quite weird um to be a rational person today and not be a progressive um and forward-thinking person to not have nuanced balanced opinions on things but this constant massaging of victimhood is so oddly it's so oddly counterintuitive if what you actually want is for people to rise up. Two things. Today, the Hot Dogs Film Festival, which I'm sure some of you 
know about hot dogs. It's the largest documentary film festival in the world. Um, nine programmers left. The artistic director left. There were rumors that this festival may not exist beyond this year. Now, I don't know if that is true. There's a press conference tomorrow. I'll certainly try to find out more. But this is crazy. Now, for those of you who don't know, I run a film festival and we are most unapologetically unpolitical or apolitical. Like we refuse to take a side on politics because I don't think art and politics have anything to do with each other. But so many channels, so many media outlets, so many magazines, so many, you know, film festivals, so many, basically everything in the arts, Oscars, etc. There has been such a concerted effort over the last 15 years to make these things so activist driven, you know, oh, we got to eradicate this uh, imbalance and that imbalance and this and this and this. Here's the thing. You ascribe power to whatever. Um, hold on, I want to say this correctly. Not to get my words twisted here. Anything that makes you the victim. So which is to say, if something victimizes you, you are assigning that power. Okay, so that's not to say you cannot be victimized. It cannot. That's not to say that someone cannot victimize you. It's not to say that you cannot be abused. Of course, there are systemic abuses of power and dynamics, and there's corrupt governments. And to quote Lewis Black, if you want to feel your soul die, find the meeting of art and politics. Sure. Real activism or real equality or real elevation starts with powerful examples of positive behavior, not whining about negative behavior and, you know, um, pandering. That's all it is. It's pandering, right? Now, I'm very humbled that this channel has managed to still attract somewhat viewership given the place that the Raptors are in because most channels on in the Raptors sphere, I think, have suffered a far more drastic drop. And I was thinking about why that might be. And it's certainly not my face. And it's certainly not, you know, that I have the best takes on basketball or anything like that, or that I'm putting in so much work into these videos. It's nothing like that. I think it's because I've managed to be honest. And I think I've managed to be transparent. And I think it's because I've managed to own up to mistakes that I'm making as I'm making them. And that makes it okay. I, I, I do sometimes when I'm curious, maybe when I have like an hour here, an hour there, I will go and listen to other, you know, Raptors stuff or whatever. And I got to say, I find a lot of it kind of hard to listen to because I find it like, like it's piggybacking on something that's not true or it feels disingenuous or it feels like it's fake outrage or whatever. It just, it, it never completely feels aligned and coherent with the person. So yeah. And, and I'm real, and I'm realizing of course that telling the truth has always meant that I don't always fit into a box that it's very possible that everyone else is zigging while I'm zagging. And it's very possible that I agree with something because I'm not trying to be contrarian. I'm not trying to just say like, okay, what is, what does Samson think? And what, did, what, what did Blake Murphy think? Okay, well, I will think the opposite because I'm the opposite guy. No, sometimes like I, I have to agree with them because they're right. And yeah, I think it's been pretty cool to just have my own thoughts and to have so many people accept that it's been really, it's been really nice. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. I see more examples of people fighting for social vengeance instead of social justice. Thanks a lot for the super chat. Um, um, yeah, like, here's the thing. Uh, Sean also saying, how about the Texas A&M and Houston game? Yeah, that was nuts. Uh, there's been a lot of like really, really great college hoops the last two, three days. Um, honestly, 
I need to do so much shit for this house. Like I just tore up my office and I, I, I finally threw out some stuff and I want to repaint the home and everything. But man, it is so tempting to just sit my ass down in front of the television and just watch college hoops and, and NBA hoops all day. Um, very tempting indeed. Um, oh my God. Indiana is beating the Clippers right now. 80 to 71. Shh. crap hold on is this a good thing or a bad thing i need to check with my jonte porter app my bad that that was a very very horrible joke um okay <sighs> that was terrible sacramento is beating philadelphia uh cleveland has beaten charlotte atlanta eked out a win over boston Thus cementing, in my opinion, how important Drew Holiday and Derek White are for Boston to those people who just say it's the Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum show. Yeah, fully healthy. I mean, not fully healthy, but Jason Tatum and Joe. You know, the, the Celtics have been doing this thing where they've been swapping out like different lineups every single game almost. They rest like they'll rest Drew and then they'll rest Derek White and then they'll rest Jason Tatum and then they'll rest uh uh Jalen Brown and do you know what I mean they've been doing that sort of thing and and they just keep winning regardless so I think they finally found out who they can't win without um D1S1 is it possible that we lose a pick after they investigate Jonte no I do not think so number one um it would have to be shown that the organization knew about what he was doing he does not stand for the organization just like Jalen like when you saw the Minnesota Timberwolves lose like a ton of picks uh, for the Joe Smith scandal, that's because the Minnesota Timberwolves did something. When I believe the Miami Heat or some team lost uh, a pick for tampering, um, yeah, like this is this is team. Um, but what un unless you can show? I mean, this has just been such a strange season for the Raptors because you had the Knicks lawsuit. Right. Then you had Christian Coloco. Not that that was a scandal, but, you know, it was it was a big story outside of specifically on the basketball court. It was an off the basketball court story. Then, of course, you have R.J. Barrett's brother passing away. Then you have Jonte Porter. Um, this scandal, you have Emmanuel Quickly's uncle. Um, I mean, like, geez, like talk about a, a season, like a season from hell in, in so many ways. Um and to and to top all of this off, if you lose your draft pick, like a lot of it will be for nothing, because it does not look like, it doesn't specifically look like the um, Pacers pick is going to be top fifteen. Like so, it's probably going to be seventeenth or eighteenth pick. Now, I realize a lot of people are very anxious to. Okay, sorry, I just want to finish the hot dogs thought. I think that film festivals and arts agencies and organizations should not be propaganda machines personally i think art should be art speaking of art being art to those who are fans of cinema april 17th scotia bank theater uh downtown toronto pendance is hosting a canada film day screening of xavier dolan's feature debut um j'ai tout ma mère uh it's like my French is horrible, but it, it means I killed my mother. And Delphine. Um, these are two of the best Canadian films, and it's free. So tickets will go on sale for those tomorrow. I hope some of you can come out. Maybe some of you that missed Pendance will get a chance to see this. It's like super downtown, obviously, Scotiabank Theater, 9.30 p.m. Um, hopefully, it's a really full house. These are great films. These are incredible films. Um, yeah. And they're about childhood and and about figuring things out and about navigating adults and it's cool it's not a social justice -y type of thing but nevertheless um okay we little john i'm gonna bring you on but i'm just gonna let you know i have exactly 10 minutes what's going on man hello your mic is off can you hear me yeah what's up yeah, how you doing, man? I wanted to speak about you. Uh, you you still want to talk about that John Jay situation? If you have something to add to it, sure. Do you think banning him is would be disingenuous? Because I feel like 
promoting promoting the gambling stuff left, right, and center, and then banning somebody. Like, I don't know. I feel like that's a little unfair. Um, I don't see how the two are related. Look, I'm obviously very, very firmly against the sports betting thing, right? I think I've recounted in previous lives how I think I've lost like close to fifteen, eighteen, twenty thousand dollars by not accepting sports betting sponsorships because I refuse to promote this shit because I know how dangerous it can be for people's minds. I know that. Like, I know how addictive it can be. I I feel it um, from people that I've watched go down this road, and yeah. Like if you're not in control of it, it, it can it can wreck your life. And I know that. And most people will lose. The math on this is clear. Most people will lose a ton of money. And uh, the odds are so skewed. So I get all of that. So yeah, when I'm listening to The Ringer, when I'm listening to all these shows, everything I hear is, and DraftKings, and this, and that. And I'm like, oh my God, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Like, like Rob, tomorrow when Malika Andrews reports on it it's going to be it's going to be like brought to you by draft yeah. right well that's that's fair but the two things are not they're not equivalent because you I are know, a player in the nba you have an individual contract this would be like saying i don't know let's just say tomorrow these guys are young man these guys are young he's 24 years old like he's one of my favorite players but he's 24 years old and he's really smart so he knew what he was doing um, and he knew that it was wrong. But this is this is the first. This is going to happen a lot more. I mean, this is why they're doing it to Jonte Porter, so that everyone can see. Ah, see, like they made an example of that guy. Don't do this. And you know, well, if it's, they it's still look, man, this stupid. is okay. Here's the thing: if they give him like a two month suspension, yeah, it's going to continue. Then it, it it will continue everything. So the precedent here is you have to make a really strong example out of this. And, you sure. know, a two year ban or a one year ban is to how you do that for the Raptors. And of course, for Jonte, who's already had so many hiccups, if he is found guilty, like I guarantee you, he's not playing basketball next year. And that oh, in yeah, itself, yeah. I'm fine with that. I, I was thinking, well, why are you fine with that? Because he's a really good thinking, young player. No, I was thinking a lifetime ban is unfair. That's a little wild. Lifetime, I was that because so I'm like, this guy's. I don't think they're gonna do job. a life, I don't think they're gonna do a lifetime ban. Like, he, he <laughs> imagine didn't, he, having to find a new job. I mean, or he wouldn't, maybe he, he could he just wouldn't, go overseas. That's exactly it. Um, yeah, I don't think it'll be a lifetime ban, but I would be very shocked if it's less than a one year ban. Oh, and it's gonna be one it's year, be like two, three years, two to three years. One is um, actually kind of light, to be honest. One in your back, that's kind of like that's like, I mean, so. okay, so here's the thing <laughs> conflicting thoughts. Number one, I, I, I seem to think he's very smart, so maybe he covered his tracks just well enough that they won't be able to find the dirt on him. But then he ended up doing an interview with Warwick Report, so I'm like, how smart is he? I heard, really? I heard that, yeah. I, I, I don't know the stocks, I, hmm. Was it about the stocks? I heard I seen a clip about him uh speaking about stocks and how he's uh. Hedge funding and shit, shit like that. Well, no, I'm saying like he did a he did a interview with a Raptors channel that I do not like, and oh, okay. um, yeah, I yeah, didn't like, and, and I was just like, okay, whoa, what? Um, just just really random, and I thought that was like a really weird move, and I was like, who's around him that he's allowed to do that, or he's he's even curious to do that? Like maybe the guy met him at the 905 and became friends or something. I have no idea, but nevertheless, I think um, you know this this uh, if found guilty, like yeah, yeah, we're looking at one to two years minimum. Did you see? Did you did you read the details? Uh, it's it's pretty damning. Um, I think it said. It happened twice. He left. The, he left the game early. Yep. Um, and and so uh, you know someone had taken so, the under, etc. But then the motive is like he doesn't want to mess up his stats because I'm on a two way. So like think about that, right? He doesn't want to mess up his stats. So instead, I'll just leave because I'm also trying to make a mark in the NBA. So instead of you know go you know going two for twelve, and you know being under your total. I'm just going to leave. <laughs> so like he's playing both sides, which is, it makes it kind of funny because he's like, I'll just leave. 
and that way I'll ensure the the under without messing up my my stats for the Raptors. If the NBA really wanted to dig into this, I guarantee you at least five percent of players do this regularly. There's, yeah, I, there's I know absolutely just stuff like that going on, but like between a I know of a player who did this, um, for sure. With like sports book. And this There's was like, stuff going this was on like, like 10, friends. 12 years ago, and they never got caught for this. And I, and I know for a fact they were doing it um, through through one of their family members. So, you know, like they just kind of they were just like, OK, tonight's going to be like. I'm feeling I'm feeling points tonight, you know, or something like we're that. Playing and the wizards. Huh? <laughs> we're playing the wizards and, you know, I'm like, it's probably a lot easier to do if you're a uh, really good player. Jante doing it twice being Jante like that's just. Wow, I just can't believe I can't believe he did that. Right. Did, was it twice or was it was it twice or three times? Twice. I it's believe honestly, it was twice. But to like put it to the to Raptors perspective, it's disappointing because I'm I was right there with you. Of all these guys who were two way guys, the G League guys, he was the only one who to me had a chance of sticking. He's not he the had, only he, one that has a chance of sticking. I think you know he had the best shot. He had the best shot by far, yes. Um, That's and, my point, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm oh learning God. I'm learning one thing, like, you know, it's it's about understanding blind spots, right? Some people have a blind spot, like they really, really love draft picks, or some people really, really like young guards, or some people really like bigs or whatever. I have a bias towards youth and um utility role players. Like I just really like youth and, and utility role players. So when I see a 19 or 20 year old, I, I'll, I almost always assume a little bit too much on the upside. And when it comes to a 30 year old, I almost always assume too much on the decline. So I'm trying to learn now, like, hey, this is a serviceable, granted serviceable, very serviceable, um, skilled big with a very checkered injury history who's 24 years old. And you have three draft picks, you know, potentially this, this, uh, this coming draft like what are the chances that you draft someone who's as good as him within two years yeah it's possible you know yeah that's not possible. likely but it's possible I, um I because he's flashing like one box of minus right now which is crazy yeah, let, let me pull that up i was thinking of like his advanced stats must be terrific they are they are freaking awesome yeah, he's a 15 PER, which is pretty good for a backup. Yeah, that's league uh, average. And his, his, a, his efficiency isn't even good, which means he's just that effective. It's defense. Uh, so PER yeah, is a, a horrible, horrible, well. horrible. Um, but yeah, PER sucks, but still, like, if if your PER is good and you're not even efficient, because he's he's 38 percent from the field, that would, that means he's like just a very very stats guy. Like he puts up stats. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's at one steal a game and two, uh, one one steal, one block a game almost. Yeah, That's he's really a one point six box plus minus guy. To put into context how impressive that is, um, that's higher than RJ Barrett. That's higher than every player on this team, other than Scotty Barnes, um, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, is that that's also higher than that that's might higher also than be? almost everyone. I, quickly was probably a little bit higher when he was in Nick. Mm, no, he wasn't. I don't think so. Um, I can I can double check I can double check that, but I don't I don't think he was higher than than one point six. He might have been just around there, uh, but yeah, well, it's I, I, it's I, Scotty and him. It, you know, here's something funny: Jonte Porter's box plus minus is higher than Pascal Siakam's was as a Raptor. Yeah, I can believe. Does that, that blow your mind? Yeah. So yeah, this kinda, is yeah. like his defensive box plus minus is higher than any player on the Raptors. It's a two. Well, yeah, like his because Siakam. Siakam's defensive box of minus hasn't been good for a long time. And it's, it really was never great, to be honest. Correct. He's really just been offensive driven for, you know, more than people think. But I wanted to ask you. Yeah, so I so Mayo quickly was a 2.4 with the Knicks. You're right. So he was higher. I've I see, I seen someone allude to the Raptors might be might lose a pick. Like, did you have you have you thought about that? Because I was kind of yeah. I've already late. talked about it, and and like this is the thing about coming on late, and then you you end up bringing up stuff that we already talked about. Unfortunately, I already talked about it. I don't think they're going to lose a pick. They're not involved. They don't have anything to do with it. Yeah. So all right. So yeah, that's yeah. That's really what I wanted to speak about. Uh, so yeah, uh, the Raptors lost, and you know, that's that's the goal again. Just keep losing, right? So 
You gotta yeah. oh, you gotta you gotta give Dennis Schroeder his flowers for 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 helping that happen. Give Bruce Brown his <laughs> yeah. flowers for those turnovers, clutch turnovers, and give um, Kelly Olynyk you know some some props to those four four turnovers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Clutch loss. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, I know Dennis. He had that uh, he had that that tiger in his eye because he's like, I want to be my old team, but he doesn't realize that he actually want to lose as well. So I was thinking about that. Like, we actually want to lose too. So. Go ahead I'm sure, and, I'm sure he knew. <laughs> I'm sure he knew. But he yeah. probably does. He probably's like, yeah, it's yeah. mutually beneficial. Yeah. All right, man. Peace. Have a good one. All right, man. Thanks, man. See ya. Okay. Um. Yeah. To finish off a very disjointed point on hot dogs and this wokeness thing, I think that. You cannot empower people by talking all day about why they are disempowered. You can't. You cannot talk about, you cannot start, you can accept it within yourselves and you can restructure policy based on, you know, understanding, you know, for instance, you know, I was listening to um, The Odd Couple with Chris Broussard and, you know, the other guy whose name I can't remember right now. And they were talking about how um, there's no disparity in sports when it comes to race. And I'm like, isn't there? Isn't there some disparity? Does it, does, does, is there not a social element to two parent households versus one parent households? Isn't it easier to raise a young athlete if you have two parents? Money driving them to AAU, driving them, shuttling them all across the country. How is that possible if you're a single parent? It's just harder. So naturally, if there is a particular culture, and I'm trying to say that like we are designed to fail, like as a society, we're designed to fail. I'm trying to tell you like, dude, I'll give you an example. I ate way too much toothpaste when I was when I was like five or six years old. I love the taste of this toothpaste and I just kept eating it. And then someone told my dad, it's like, yo, like his brain is going to be messed up if he, if you not force him to stop eating this toothpaste. And I was compulsively eating this toothpaste. And I think a lot of kids ingest a lot of fluoride through their toothpaste, not realizing it drastically impairs your cognitive function and your brain development, right? There's so many of us that are, you know, we're like, this world is so weirdly complicated. You have a messaging system like the CBC or whatever, uh, or TIFF or hot dogs or whatever. And their whole message to the whole world is look at these social injustices that we are, you know, correcting. What is this? This is virtue signaling at, at its at its best case, it's virtue signaling, right? it's it's saying look at us look at how progressive we are look at how good we are we don't participate in this we condemn it right we hate that we hate the right people we love the right people and it's just like okay cool you know but it's virtue signaling on the most and that's the best case outcome the worst case outcome is it's actually a bigger part of the problem because all you're doing is talking about it you're not really providing great solutions and you're creating this entire like victim mentality you know, towards everything where everybody just gets to play victim. And and I'm sorry, that's just it's just my opinion. It's not really effective. It's not an effective coping strategy in life. Very often in life, if you want to get ahead, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And you're going to have to accept that there are things that you cannot change. And there are things that, you know, there are always going to be people that are going to hate you. And there are going to be people out there who are going to judge you. And that you just have to be successful regardless. And that's not to say that, you know, historical, you know, oppression does not exist or that racism doesn't exist or that, you know, cops are not, but not all cops. Like, don't, don't create this framework. Not all white people, not all black people. Like, why, why we, we think in such absolutes about this stuff? is so strange to me. And so often, as we're telling the story of oppression and repression and silenced voices, you are creating very powerful figures out of the oppressors and creating very powerless figures out of the oppressed. And then you are asking the oppressed to go and free themselves. 
this is i'm sorry like what what the hell right like why not tell stories you know if if your goal significantly is to tell the story of like honestly it's weird i feel like we're going backwards like when i was growing up in new york we had black history month in black history month all we heard i swear to god we had an african-american teacher we we heard like hundreds of inspirational stories about abolitionists and you know inventors and engineers and politicians and trailblazers and i don't know like i felt like a lot of the black students around me were feeling very proud of their heritage and that is good pride is good pride is great because if they they're thinking like uh, you can do it i can do it you know she can do it i can do it that was great and for the non-black kids in the, in the class there were very few it allowed us to see that like this is how their lineage and their history is integrated in u.s history which was great this was great but imagine if that was not my upbringing if my upbringing was not hearing stories about african-american engineers and and trailblazers and entrepreneurs and social you know uh, activists and people who changed the world but rather just hearing about lynchings and hearing about people who got shot all day and those became the heroes how are those people heroes they're tragic figures they're they're people you should mourn but they, they should not be the emblem of your entire culture because if your emblem of the entire culture is the victim of a shooting do you see what i mean then you become the culture that is technically worshiping victims and expecting to become victors do you see the insidious nature of this like i realize i'm probably you know uh, entering into conversations that i probably don't really have a place in um but i just want to say that if you are looking up to someone and, and and looking up to someone as a victim don't you can feel bad for a victim you you can you absolutely can but imagine if all of my childhood heroes were kids who got beat up or or people who were abused as children i was like yeah these are going to be my heroes those were not my heroes i'm sorry those are not my heroes those were my those were some of my friends right um 416 jonte rigged our season we could have beat the clippers meanwhile chris puts his body on the line for his team shame what number one you don't know this right number two like what if jonte porter has given us losses then jonte porter has given us a gift Paradise lost. NBA will punish Jonte so bad, so other players learn a lesson. That's my point. That's my point because you finally have a quote unquote, you know, um, you have a throwaway, you know, in him, in Jalen Harris. These guys don't matter to anybody, right? They're not highly touted. They're not lottery picks. They're not on big rookie contracts. There wasn't a significant amount of buzz of them coming into the league. There's not a lot of fanfare for them currently now that they are in the league and yeah no one's really gonna miss them i'm gonna miss them i'm ended up missing both of them but sucks anyways i don't want to presume that jante is 100 guilty just because it looks fishy and he's really smart maybe um that's why they think he's guilty because they know he's really smart and he is someone who could pull off something like this however i will say from darko ryakovich's reaction it did not seem like he was of the he seemed to be distancing himself very, very quickly from this situation, not only by saying that he's never gambled, which I don't doubt is true. Like, I, I don't doubt that. Like, I'm sure he's never gambled. He seems like a very principled individual who maybe has that as a as one of his key principles. Don't gamble, you know, and that's a great principle to have. My dad never gambled either, um, ever. So that's that's awesome. Uh, I don't know, um, but it, it doesn't seem good. It does not seem good. Sheridan Forbes saying the gambling won't stop. Sure. Uh, maybe it won't. Um, maybe it won't. Anyway, I'll talk to y'all later. Sorry about the disjointed nature of this live. I've been trying to say a whole bunch of things. Let me try to sum up everything I've been trying to say. Number one, the Raptors losing is a good thing. Number two, I hope to continue to lose. Number three, Dennis Schroeder and 
Jonte Porter, sorry, damn, Dennis Schroeder, Kelly Olenek, and Bruce Brown get my three stars for Raptors slash X Raptors who made this happen. Number four, I'm not really sure what the hell I'm supposed to be looking forward to to the season, but mathematically, it's still very possible that the Raptors could lose every single game for the rest of the season and still lose their pick, which is kind of daunting if you think about it. Number six, this is this season has been a when it rains it pours type of season, and the Shante Porter thing is the last feels like a final straw for me in terms of just my sanity and <clears throat> how difficult this is. Um, number eight hot dots and the fallout of that and all the layoffs in the media space are evidence that don't preach the shit to people like you don't have to preach it this way um i remember when beat reporters just covered the news they didn't have an opinion because i think a lot of beat reporters frankly are not intelligent enough to have deep opinions about the news case in point doug smith It's not, he's not, he's not sophisticated enough or smart enough about basketball to have intelligent views about basketball. But unfortunately, he's forced to have intelligent views on basketball. You consider even what's happening with hot dogs. Now, I don't know in full detail, but there's a lot of pressure on them to youth and, well, I was going to say euthanize. No, uh, to, <laughs> it's a real Michael Scott moment for me there. My bad to to make their audience a little bit younger because hot dogs of course if you've been to hot dogs film festival you realize that their audience is often really old and it's not always but they have a lot of old people in their audience it's a little bit older audience than ours or tiff or whatever and um obviously a lot of those people passed away during the pandemic number one elephant in the room number two also those people were immunocompromised and really are the last people to return to normal when it comes to post you know pandemic stuff and so obviously there's new programs that have been introduced at hot dogs to put butts in seats because clearly after two years or a year and a half of not going to theaters people are more inclined than ever to just sit at home and watch movies in their home why wouldn't they right why would they go to a public space and risk getting COVID or risk getting a disease or even waste time commuting or pay for parking if they could effectively have something very similar at home without all the added people and coughing and stupid people like phones going off. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it makes sense. And, um, you know, in order to make, in order to compete as a film festival, you have to find a way to bring that sort of IMAX Fast and Furious 9 experience to to the cinema and and that's very hard um so i think that's part of why things are going badly for hot dogs but also just in terms of like the media in general magazines newspapers the layoffs that we've heard about i think a lot of this is just because people are changing their appetite in terms of where they get news and if you're going to succeed in a newspaper or as a magazine or as a film festival i think you need to lead with honesty um, because people are not willing to pay to be lied to I think. Um, yeah. And my final point, of course, was that if you're trying to empower people, don't victimize them. Yeah. All right. Man, I hope this slide made sense because it was pretty scattered all over the place. Um, please like the video on the way out if you're also grateful for this wonderful intelligent growing Raptor fan community will upgrade it. Aw, thank you so much, She Wolf. I really appreciate you. And um, yeah. Thanks. Jonte was a poor man's Marcus all sad that he threw away his future. Um, here's the thing. I don't think he's thrown away his future at all. Um, if I know anything about Jonte Porter is that regardless of how the situation turns out, that he's going to be phenomenally successful, that he's going to be um, really great at wherever he goes next. If it's playing basketball, if it's trading, you know, if it's prop betting, whatever it is, this is, uh, Jonte Porter is a renaissance man. Um, it would not surprise me in the least if he starts a tech company and makes a billion dollars in, in our lifetime. I'm telling you, dude's really hella smart. So yeah, hopefully he was hella, hella smart enough to cover his tracks a little bit better than I think he did here. Um, but I have a feeling he'll land on his feet and then he'll be just fine. Like I'm not worried about Jonte Porter at all. I'm more worried about the Toronto Raptors, if I'm being completely frank, because he's one of the better players. And one of the only times that I've seen us just bring a guy in from 
the undrafted heap and it actually works out like he's the second guy i think fred was the first guy so after striking out on justin champagne and after striking out on so many other players uh ron harper jr etc marquise noel like to strike out so many times to finally strike gold on a player and then to have this happen feels like a bit of a kick in the gonads but yeah um in the raptors perspective yeah so feel bad for the raptors and i don't really feel bad for him at all it's not that's not me being heartless i i, I appreciate jante a lot uh, but he knows what he did if he did it um he'll probably he probably knew the consequences going in and um he'll be fine he'll land on his feet uh there's not gonna be some huge penalty or anything like that i'm hoping for his sake there's not gonna be some huge penalty or whatever but yeah um yeah all right guys take care see you and thanks a lot again for all these super chats um clan homes uh with a super chat here uh what is your favorite basketball movie of all time damn that is a great question i have a lot actually um so i really like eddie uh with whoopi goldberg i don't know why i love that i love that movie um i don't mind six man it's all right um sunset park is pretty cool i really like above the rim i really like above the rim with tupac and bernie mac um i like coach carter so why is so bruce saying coach carter i like i like coach carter um i, I did like space jam when i saw it in theaters in 1995 96. um i'm not a fan of kazam didn't watch thunderstruck like mike is just it's too much it's too much bro but i, I like the fact that vince carter was in it that was pretty cool the blow bow wow um hoosiers is up there too white men can't jump is pretty good too yeah so i'm i'm gonna say probably above the rim yeah i'm gonna go with probably above the rim I think it's just something about the performances, the grief turn, the fact that Tupac is in it, um, the fact that that guard reminds me of Kyle Lowry for some reason. Um, I don't know. Like, there's a there's a lot there's a lot to it. Um, my backup would be Sunset Park. My backup would be Coach Carter. So yeah, those those are my those are my three basketball movies they're probably not the most evolved basketball movies hold on basketball diaries oh shit basketball diaries with leonardo dicaprio that movie is stupidly underrated it's actually pretty good too um i'm missing something i don't think so no i think i think that's it anyways yeah 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 yeah, yeah um it's crazy to see terrence howard in that movie and also see um channing tatum in that movie like it's called yeah what is your biggest fear mr cruz yo uh, uh it was a timo cruz timo cruz was the original steph curry um that guy was dope i mean that moment where he comes back and he says now i know it's cheesy as fuck and i please understand like i i understand film well enough to know when something is cheesy and when something is just plain effective um yeah like it it shattered me dude like when he comes in and he's just like what i gotta do to play i'll do anything just i gotta get back on the team i gotta get back on the team whatever and um and then like kind of watching the team do his suicides for him when he runs out or whatever i thought that was just like that was crazy it was great um it's very blind side you know like emotional cue strong whatever um but i thought it was interesting um yeah lately i've been letting netflix just do its own thing when it comes to movies and it's been really cool it's been really interesting um yeah I watched um I watched a bunch of Bollywood movies um a couple of days ago. There's a okay, so there's damn it, hold on. Uh I'll tell you what it was. Um 
so one was no one no one killed jessica and the other one was mom these were both bollywood films and there was another one something oh man i don't remember what these are called i watched like four so that was that was kind of cool that was kind of crazy i hadn't watched bollywood films in a really long time and i just decided i needed to watch three or four of them in in a row and that was crazy um does anyone know what i'm talking about hold on i'll tell you what it is um does anyone know what i'm talking about i don't know um but yeah it was it, it was it was really great it's just allowing netflix to just sort of choose movies for me has been very interesting i also watched a movie um about uh vampires in the, on a plane it was not snakes on a plane it was vampires on a plane it's called blood sky or blood red sky not great not great at all not indian it was um i think it was norwegian or german it might have been german um yeah but the indian films are great they were really good um especially that no one no one killed jessica they're all like it's really interesting all of these indian films are like evaluating bureaucratic political struggles corruption but the one film that i'm like really 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 amazed by i can't remember the name and it's it's about like this school uh for orphaned kids um and it's starring Bumi Padnekar. It's called, hold on, Bakshak. Yep. Yep. It's called Bakshak. Hold on. Let me see if there's a trailer for it. I feel like I need to give this movie a shout out because it's freaking awesome. It's really good. I promise you. It is good, good. Or would I get copyright strike for it? Possibly. Okay, hang on. I'm gonna pull this up. Here's a first ever here. Yeah, this. It's really good. Okay, I'm going to pull myself off. Anath ka matlab samajhte ho. Chup ke chup ke. Jiska koi naath nahi hota. Ek khilana. Tum log hai ki nahi hai. Uda hai sabne. Kisi ko nahi pata. Social audit mein aaya madam ki Munawarpur Balka Giri mein bachche sabke sath dushkarm ho. क्या रिपोर्टिंग कर रही हो तुम आजकल और कौन से बालिका गिरी के चक्कर में हो फोटो वोटो खींच रहे हैं आप तो बिना काम के आना मना है यहाँ चलिए निकलिए अगर दो तीन महीने से ये रिपोर्ट सरकार के पास है और सरकार कुछ नहीं कर रही तो बंसी साहू की पहुंच कहाँ तक है तुम्हें समझ में आ रहा है ना आप तो एकदम हमारे पीछे पड़ गई है सच खोजने का कोशिश कर रहे हैं और उसमें तो कुछ गलत है नहीं कहा आत्महत्या करना चाहते हैं कोई भी मीडिया हाउस इस खबर को चला नहीं रहा और ना ही इस पर कोई खोजबीन हो रही है। एक तो इतना मुश्किल से मंत्री पद मिला है पत्नी कहा है? हाथ भी मत लगाना उस अरे रिपोर्टर है इसीलिए चुप बैठे हैं। नहीं तो गला काट कर रेलवे के पटरी में डाल दिए होते अब तक आज तो कौन लड़की को लेके गए तुमको लेके जाएंगे ताकत झोंकना है भास्कर जी उन बच्चियों को इंसाफ दिला ज्यादा उम्मीद मत रखना केस बहुत स्ट्रॉन्ग नहीं है अरविंद उन छोटी बच्चियों के साथ गलत काम कर रहा है बंसी साहू समझ रहे हो तुम हमारे घर की बच्ची के साथ कोई गलत कर रहा है नहीं तो कहा इमोशनल हो रही हो जब तक दूसरे के घर में गलत हो रहा है तब तक कोई कुछ नहीं बोलेगा लेकिन ये याद रखना अरविंद की अगर दूसरे की बेटी के साथ गलत हो रहा है तुम्हारी बेटी के साथ भी होगा इसे बोलना पड़ेगा अरविंद आज बंसी साहू का कुंडली लिखेंगे हम हाँ। 
दूसरों के दर्द में दुखी होना भूल गए हैं क्या क्या अब भी आप अपनी गिनती इंसानों में करते हैं या अपने आप को भक्षक मान चुके हैं My bad, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, let me repeat that. I need to make a list of things on Netflix to watch because I listen to a lot of people say that they watch every single thing on Netflix and I promise you, you have it. There's some incredible French movies. There's an incredible Spanish movie. There's um, these really good Indian movies. Uh, there's, um, yeah, man, there, there are some incredible, incredible ones. love is blind is that what 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 language is that from oh my god what what no Oh God, sorry, not to judge it, but Nick Lachey, no, I'm, I'm good. Maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Um, I'm sure it's very popular. But no, nah, not quite. Um, <clears throat> yeah, anyway, we're live. Um, the Pacers have beat the clippers so that's really fuck <laughs> shit that really sucks um this has been the day of upsets also the clippers just lost i can't remember to who but like they lost to a team they were not supposed to lose to a couple of days ago as well i think they lost to yeah the clippers are in free fall right now it, it's weird like, things are going so well for them like four or five weeks ago like we were talking about everyone was talking about the most nba championship contenders and the minute people did that it's just like it's not even like paul george and uh Anson saying i read porter's locker has been cleaned out yeah again i don't doubt it have you seen life is beautiful it's tremendous never heard of it yeah Lots, lots of movies. Um, maybe we need to do a chess and movie talks live. People get upset when we do lives that aren't centered on basketball. Because they'd be like, Pensara basketball should be all about basketball. But sometimes it's not. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. It does not look like that's going to happen, though. Anyways, talk to you later, guys. Have a good one. And thanks to the, the five super chats. It was really generous of you guys. Thank you.